A man defines himself by his make-believe, as well as by his sincere impulses. There is thus a lower key of feelings, inaccessible in the heart, but partially disclosed by the acts they imply, and the attitudes of mind they assume. Men are creatures fueled by desires. We want sensual pleasures, novel experiences, and lifetime fulfillment, all at once and only on our terms. Our want to fulfill these desires is an inextricable part of the human condition, and only a few will ever be able to pluck its tree and taste its sweet, elusive fruits. What separates the men who always seem to get what they want versus the men who don't come from an unconscious understanding of what I call the paradox of desire. Most men will die unaware of this paradox. However, those who discover it will have a greater opportunity to manifest a life that most men could only ever dream of having. Everyone, to a greater or lesser degree, desires to achieve greatness and win at life. We all want the perfect body, the perfect relationship, the perfect car, the perfect house, the perfect life that we see as our ideal. But as our expectations to fulfill these desires grow, so does our impatience. And so immediate gratification takes precedence over delayed gratification, which produces quicker, but often more disappointing results. In some cases, however, delayed gratification can be missed opportunities. If we feign desire in someone to downplay our attraction to them, then we run the risk of them seeing us as uninterested. If we don't spend our money on the things we want now, we may not have the money to afford it later. How do we juggle these conflicting desires? Why does it seem that those who want it more get scraps in return, yet those free from want seem to have everything fall in their lap? Shouldn't the one who wants it more deserve more? Before we can answer these questions, we must first traverse into the darkness of the male psyche. Men are driven by burning passions which can easily lead them to distraction. In most cases, men's success drive is fickle. It is their reward drive that is not. Many evolutionary scientists have postulated several reasons why men are like this. In particular, men have more of an innate predisposition to seek status and acquire resources. Sexual selection theory suggests the idea of young male syndrome, which describes the tendency for men to engage in risky or competitive behaviors that could result in possible death but also a chance to earn prestige and mating opportunities. Other researchers have attributed it to precarious manhood, a sociocultural influence originating from our evolutionary design. They surmise that men are driven to succeed because only men must go through a rite of passage to achieve manhood, unlike womanhood. Men are thus rewarded once they meet their tribe or society's standards. Whatever the case may be, it is clear that men are willing to do more, risk more, and even die for a chance to become someone worthy in the eyes of men. Otherwise, one might as well be buried in an unmarked grave. However, some men may see these status-seeking behaviors as an effort in futility. Indeed, why buy the cow when you can get the milk for free? Why engage in the frivolity of life's struggles when there are so many ways a man can get his quick fix? The highs are so much easier to achieve if one stoops low enough. Heavy alcohol to dull your senses, unnatural drugs to distort your mind, empty porn to stroke away your loneliness too, and if you survive the aftermath, you begin each day anew. Indeed, the highs are so much easier, but the fall after is that much greater. Our access to convenient technological wonders that produce artificial pleasures are both mankind's greatest dream and worst nightmare. Today's men truly are an enslaved generation. Anything great that was ever achieved always comes at a price. Perhaps men today are paying too much of a price. They realize the absurdity of it all, the toiling of working a job, the painstaking efforts of earning a means to live, the endless corporate ladder climbing and sycophantic nonsense one has to endure every single day, only to ask themselves is it really worth it? How many men have died who never lived up to their full potential? Or worse, how many were so close to becoming someone noteworthy in the pages of history, 
only to have theirs be ripped out by an early death or unfortunate accident. How many do you think? French philosopher Albert Camus echoed these sentiments in his essay, The Myth of Sisyphus. Sisyphus was a Greek legend about the king of Ephyra, a mere mortal. He cheated death twice and was punished by the gods for his hubris and cunning. Camus states the following. The gods had condemned Sisyphus to ceaselessly rolling a rock to the top of a mountain, whence the stone would fall back of its own weight. They had thought with some reason that there is no more dreadful punishment than futile and hopeless labor. Indeed, futile and hopeless labor is what most try to avoid. However, it is inevitable no matter how much we try to escape it. We all strive tirelessly and ceaselessly every day, our lives and its struggles given to us even though we never asked for them. Such is our lot. Some men may see life and its impending death as motivation, as a means to maximize ambition and attain as much as one can until everything fades to black. Other men may see life as despair, a mortal coil that will unravel when we draw our last breath. For these men, they see no reason why they should do anything at all in the face of such vanity. However, since our lives have become much more open to public scrutiny, thanks to the internet and social media, we can now see that even ambitious men suffer from the same existential crises and struggles as despairing men, some of them even committing suicide at the height of their success, despite having what many would consider to be the perfect life. The men who seem to have everything are, in their eyes, nothing. Maybe the divide between the ambitious man and the desperate man is not so wide after all. Most men are not exceptions to the rule. As Henry David Thoreau once remarked, the mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation. And like Sisyphus, our existence is, in some ways, a condemnation for a crime we did not commit. We are simply victims of circumstance in an indifferent universe, floating on a backwater planet in the darkness of space. Camus reflected upon the seemingly pointless existence of man and regarded Sisyphus not as a tragic figure, but instead as an absurd hero. He is, as much through his passions as through his torture, his scorn of the gods, his hatred of death, and his passions for life won him that unspeakable penalty in which the whole being is exerted toward accomplishing nothing. This is the price that must be paid for the passions of the earth. The passions of the earth, the desire to potentially have everything you could ever want, requires a man to don on his metaphorical cape and become the absurd hero. Only the ones who embrace this notion will unlock the existential endurance necessary to live a life most men never will. Can such a mindset really make an impact despite the harsh nature of our feudal existence? Behavioral economist Dan Ariely noted a study which experimented on how workers would react if the meaning of their work was compromised. They divided the participants into two groups and had them assemble Lego Bionicles per instructions. Each participant was given money when they finished assembling one of the models and were gradually given a little bit less for every model completed afterwards should they decide to continue. However, in the first group, each model that was completed was stored away intact, while in the second group, each model was disassembled in front of the participant after they had started a new one. They were testing what they refer to as the Sisyphean condition. The results? The ones who were in the first group, the meaningful condition, built 10.6 models and received approximately 20% more money in comparison to the second group who made only 7.2 models under the Sisyphean condition. From these conclusions, he states that the translation of joy into willingness to work seems to depend to a large degree on how much meaning we can attribute to our own labor. This begs the question, why does work need to be meaningful to make it worthwhile? Doesn't this contradict the notion that men are more reward-driven than success-driven? Not quite. While men do engage in reward-seeking behaviors, not all rewards are created equal. Material wealth can be a potent motivator and strong reinforcer, but in the long term, 
it is limited in its capacity to drive us beyond our limits. The path of least resistance, if adequate enough to fulfill our basic needs, is what most will take. A minimum wage existence to live a seemingly enjoyable life over a fulfilling one. We are, in many ways, living under the Sisyphean condition. Men's obesity rates are at an all-time high, depression has increased, unemployment steadily rising, and male virginity is the highest it's ever been. Even basic self-care is considered profound wisdom, with books from intellectuals like Jordan Peterson, best known for his best-selling 12 Rules for Life. Examples like Clean Your Room, Stand Up Straight With Your Shoulders Back, Pursue What Is Meaningful, all of which we would consider practical and universal. Indeed, we have fallen far from the tree our ancestors have planted with their blood, sweat, and tears. Thousands of years in our struggle against nature to survive has led us to this. An obese, depressed, sexually impotent man who cannot command respect, let alone respect himself. However, this can be corrected by attaching our desires to something greater than any reward itself. In other words, our reward-seeking behaviors can be reprogrammed to do things we want to do regardless of rewards or lack thereof. As philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche once said, he who has a why to live can bear almost any how. Enter the paradox of desire. The paradox of desire is this. By wanting something more, you get very little of what you want in return. But by not wanting more, and instead doing what you want, regardless of what happens, you get more than what you would have thought possible. The key difference between these two modes of desiring is outcome dependence. The reason why most men never get what they want is because their desires are contingent upon a desired result, rather than desiring the results of the work itself. In other words, men live wanting what they want to have happen, not doing what they actually want. This is most common in addictive behaviors, which are especially prevalent in men. You see, men don't enjoy taking drugs, they enjoy the high that follows after. Men don't want to stare at a screen watching porn all day, they want the orgasm that follows after. Men don't want to gamble playing slots, pulling the lever over and over again, they want the jackpot that follows after. The actions are undesirable, but we are so easily conditioned to do them because of our outcome dependence, because of our want to want happen. Giant corporations take advantage of this psychological tendency, which is why they hire psychologists in their focus groups to study and manipulate human behavior to increase product demand and thus profits. In a hyperbolic sense, we are, to some capacity, a lab rat in a giant maze we call society, or perhaps worse, as notable behavioral psychologist B.F. Skinner once claimed, the major difference between rats and people is that rats learn from experience. Perhaps humanity's dark, checkered past, full of unspeakable atrocities, was a preemptive defense against potentially unfavorable future outcomes, even at the expense of ignoring our shared empathy and self-understanding. Thus, history repeats itself unassailed by mankind's attempts to self-correct. In short, we are addicted to what we can't control, obsessed with what we don't have, and have become enslaved by masters of our own making, the want to want happen. Only by accepting these truths as self-evident can we begin to break free from our self-destructive tendencies. Once this mindset shift occurs, however, the issue becomes what should motivate us. We want to get in shape, have financial independence, and achieve high social status. But these ambitions are outcome dependent. So how does a man get what he wants when he's motivated by the outcomes? The simple yet complicated answer is that what should motivate us is not the rewards that come from favorable outcomes, but doing what you want regardless of outcomes. The only way to get everything you want is by having no wants at all. The fruits of our labor come from the labor itself not the fruits that follow after it. It is a subtle shift in perspective, but a powerful one. It is only when we recognize the revolving door of life and death, or the hamster wheel of work and play, can we see things as they are. And, like Sisyphus, 
We continue pushing that boulder up the mountain, knowing full well it will roll back down again. But it is only at such moments can we stop to understand the why behind our actions. On the surface, what seems like endless vanity and struggle to make what we do meaningful and, by extension, consequential, is underneath a silent whimper for a calling to something much greater. Camus emphasized this point, but elaborates that such a calling is to be found in the struggle itself. The workman of today works every day in his life at the same tasks, and this fate is no less absurd but it is tragic only at the rare moments when it becomes conscious. Sisyphus, proletarian of the gods, powerless and rebellious, knows the whole extent of his wretched condition. It is what he thinks of during his descent. The lucidity that was to constitute his torture, at the same time, crowns his victory. There is no fate that cannot be surmounted by scorn. Indeed, our longings for favorable outcomes with the least amount of sacrifice on our part, while unrealistic, is a necessary condition. Because we are forced to act in order to enact our will on the world, the actions we take become central to our identity and thus a reason for living. However, our control of circumstances is limited. When we seek rewards, we get very little of what we want in return. But when we invest in our actions, we always gain something from them, whether personal insight into ourselves or a wider perspective on how to make our actions more effective. It is a form of self-improvement in some sense, but it is not done necessarily for its own sake, but for the sake of improving, because one wants to see how far they can push their limitations even if they don't improve. For example, effective bodybuilders do not focus on achieving the perfect body, that is merely a byproduct. Rather, they schedule themselves to go to the gym with the intent to improve their lifting technique and potentially increasing their max weight. Successful business owners do not focus solely on profits, but on how they can make a better product or service that will improve their customer's experience. A talented musician does not focus on creating the perfect song, but on writing more songs with the potential that the next one will be a better song than the one before. Our desires, then, should come from the want itself. Use the paradox of desire as a tool to guide you, to gauge your actions according to what you want to do, regardless of favorable or unfavorable outcomes. Although understanding this paradox frees you from want, it also limits your wants too. However, it opens you up to the greatest want of all, your true purpose. For that, you must find the task you'd be willing to do for free and still do even if you were paid not to. Your greatest desires comes from doing what you want and expecting nothing in return. Internalize this and you will have what most men never will and along with it, a happier, more fulfilling life. The struggle itself toward the heights is enough to fill a man's heart. One must imagine Sisyphus happy.